Yeah. Yeah. This little light of mine, and I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, and I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Jesus gave it to me, and I'm going to let it shine. Jesus gave it to me, and I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Okay. Mm. Okay, very good. Next, we have a reading of the Word of God coming out of King James Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 10. It is not expedient for my doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of body, I cannot tell. God knows. Such, an, such as one caught up to the third heaven. I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear. Least any man should think of me above that which I see it me to be or that he bears of, he hears me at least i should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations there was given to me a thorn in the flesh the messenger of satan to buffet me least i shall be exalted above measure for this thing i besought the, lo the lord thrice that i that it might depart from me he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. May the Lord add a blessing unto the reading of his word. Amen. 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 Shall we pray? This morning, our Heavenly Father, it is once again that we, it's just few of your humble, dedicated servants, have assembled ourselves unto the house of worship. Father, we come before we, for thee, to say, Lord, we thank you for this day. This is a day that we have never seen before and a day we'll never see again. And Father, we thank you because of your goodness, your love, grace, and your mercy. We know that it all surrounds us every moment of our lives, and we say thank you. Mm -hmm. Father, we ask you to continue to bless and thank every person that's present this morning, those who come on and those who are after. And then bless us all collectively. And Father, we feel blessed because you woke us up this morning. You mm -hmm. closed us in our right mind. And you started us on our way. And Father, for this we say, Lord, we praise you, we worship, and we adore you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen. Okay. We are continuing our study in our fall quarter of looking at the nation of Israel. And we, today our focus is, we have skipped past, we've fast forwarded from all when last week's lesson, when we had the song of Moses, when he was 
getting ready to take the nation of Israel, uh, his tenure was ending and Joshua was going to take over. They was on the threshold of entering the, the promised land, which was the land of Canaan. And today we see our focus is, is on the call of Gideon, who was uh, somebody God called for a special purpose to deliver it, the Israelites out of their calamity because of their failure to commit to his ways and honor him and obey his laws. And they was living all kinds of ways. But the subtopic is confidence provides necessary courage. So if I try and give, I'm gonna give you some of the background from the, the, the lesson is coming out of the book of Judges and the sixth chapter, verses one and two, then seven through six, 16. And I, I, I took some of it out of the NIV version, but let me just continue to give us some background out of the, the setting for today's lesson. Like I said, the book of Judges covers a time period in Israel history between the death of Joshua and the establishment of the Hebrew monarchy. Now, as I started saying, we looked at Moses last, last Sunday trying to re-educate the, the younger generation on the laws of God and what he, he desires of them. Then our lesson skipped over Joshua, but he was a leader that followed Moses and took a nation into the promised land what God had already promised them. So we fast forward to generations later where they are already in the land of promise and they have failed to continue to live according to God's word and they were just doing all kinds of evil in the sight of God. Mm -hmm. And you know, and, and I'll probably say this again, God is long suffering. He's very patient with us, but he has a limit to his patience. And when you start putting other gods before him, he will just partly step aside and let everything happen to you that happens to you bad. And then, and this is what we see happening in today's lesson. And they, uh, under, before Joe, uh, Gideon answered the call to lead the people and de de defeat the Midianites who was oppressing Israel at this time. And they were so harsh in their oppression that the Midian, the Israelites, had to hide in caves and up on mountain cliffs because uh, the Midianites would wait till they, the Israelites get their crops and then they'd come and, and beat them up uh, and take their crops and they was left without nothing. Only because, first of all, they didn't do what they were supposed to do and that was to obey God and live according to his commandments. And I know I said this before, that when it's important to keep teaching every generation what thus say the law and teach our young people so that at least if they stray, they will know. Unlike if they don't, if they stray and don't know their history or their heritage. Okay, now, so, and we can relate to Israelites when they didn't have a a dedicated leader when we, and I, I, I know I asked the question, sounds familiar when this, when we as African-Americans, uh, Martin Luther King was our, our leader of leading us into the civil rights movement. to trying to get a lot of equality brought to us. So when he passed, do we still have a leader or we don't have one, I said uh, a one dedicated leader who's trying to lead us. I don't see one. Now you can correct me if I'm wrong. I know that was uh, Reverend, uh, oh geez, um, I can't call his name. I see his face, had push and a rainbow coalition, all that. But that was not just one dedicated leader who stood out and trying to do the right thing 
because he he stood for nonviolence. I didn't always personally all the way to agree with it because when you put dogs on me, it's gonna be a problem. <laughs> so all I'm trying to do is draw a parallel here from about a one central leader. They didn't have it, okay. So they had not had a leader during this time before they called Gideon, okay. And uh, yeah, this, uh, this internet better stay stable because I got to get through this lesson. So what we, and, and so here they was in all of their own little settlement and every little tribe was doing their own thing, okay. And with the absence of a strong leader, it sometimes plunged the nation into chaos. So, after Joshua died, this is what was happening because they didn't have that leadership to try to keep them and check and check for us, leading in them in the right way. Okay, and according to what uh, God's commanders had commanded how we to live. And it was interesting, we brought out yesterday's class. The Ten Commandments is still applicable to us today, even though we are no longer under the law, but under the law of grace. They still apply to us. Okay. Now, let me just kind of move on and say this. Uh, I, I want you to read the book of Judges, especially those ones. And there was 12 individuals who served as judges, and they were to try to make history or make the right decision. Well, when uh, adversities was brought to them, okay. Now, let me see if I can pronounce some of all of these judges' names. This is just for historical background information. Otheno, Otheno, he served for 40 years. He do 80 years. Shemar, he was unknown. Then there had the judge, Deborah, she was a lady. She served for 40 years. Gideon finally served 40 years. Tula, 23 years. J.R. 22 years, Jephthah 6, Abizan 7, Elon 10, and Abdon 8, and Samson 20 years. Now see, these are some minor judges, but we know about Gideon, we know about Deborah, we know about Samson. Okay, because it, they, they kind of stands out in our history, but these are always all judges. Okay, uh, now, in the book of Judges, when you read it, you see a time in Israel's history where there was like a merry-go-round of rebellion, retribution, repentance, and restoration. So it's leading up to the lesson where it is first scripture, first verses, first two verses, okay, that said this, uh, where the Israelites, did evil in the sight of the Lord. And for seven years, he, God, gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Now, remember I, I said the Midianites were, and they were relatives because <laughs> Moses had married a woman from Midian. Okay. And they knew each other and there was always conflict, but the Midianites was an evil, wicked nation and when the Israelites refused to turn back to God and stay, stay in tune with God and obeying his laws and, and doing according to his will, and like I said, he just stepped back and let the Midianites uh, oppress them for seven whole years. Well, it wasn't as long as the time that, and later when the Babylonians, uh, came in and, and, and took Israel into captivity. They were there for 70 years. So this oppression is oppression. But the point is that they he, God allowed them to go seven years. And when they cried out to God, God is faithful and to hear and to come to their rescue. Okay. Now, let me say this. Let me see what I said for verse two. I, I, okay, I said it, but I'll read it because the power of the Midianites was powerful, but, and they were so oppressed that the Israelites had to prepare shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Okay, that's now. 
in my notes and find and say that, okay, God allowed it because his patience had wore thin with the Israelites. And I asked this question, what did this say for America today? Is God patient wearing thin with us? Because now we know, but uh, are we failing to continue to teach our, our young people uh, for them to adhere? What are uh, we just decided? Well, God's going to do anyway. Uh, he's going to protect me anyway. <laughs> Not so. <laughs> Not so. <laughs> so and, and my advice or my encouragement or my suggestion is to get right, get your house in order, so you won't have to be subjected to God's wrath. Because we are no match for God and his anger. Yet yeah, he's love. He loves us and he's compassionate. But when he gets angry and get tired of our foolishness, he said, listen, I'm going to whip you. And you have not had a whipping. You thought mama and daddies were bad until God whipped you. We are his. And so he has a right to chastise us. Okay? Now, let me say this. Just as the Israelites, and this is a kind of a repetitive statement, I'm driving home a point. They were no match for the Midianites. We are no match for what the adversities that goes in our lives goes on because we turn away from God. And all he wants us to do is to put him first, obey his commands. Is it difficult? I know the world and sin looks so enticing and he looks so glamorous so we feel that, oh, I, it, it just a little bit won't bother me. You, you know, uh, let me see if I can use this analogy before I go into verses six and seven, okay? Is that as an alcoholic, when he or she is recovering, they cannot take just that one drink. Do there will be a relapse. So my point to that is that if we just a little sin, if we tolerate just a little, then his grows bigger and larger and larger. And I'll never forget my late founding pastor, uh, Roger Clark, when he was talking and preaching to us about accepting that's what is called a little innocent sin. A little bit, come next we come to find, okay, well, that's okay. Uh, we, then we kind of rationalize it away. And he always said, and pretty soon we have nibbled our way to lostness. And when you look at it in that perspective, okay, think of a sheep that's grazing out in the past or cows. A lot of them know what sheep is. I hope everybody will know that. It's, but when they are nibbling and eating and grazing and not paying attention, pretty soon if the fence is not fenced in, they will have gone on out of that a refined or confined area. Do you get the point that I'm trying to make here? If we tolerate just a little sin, pretty soon we'll be acceptance of everything that can go it that is wrong. We'd be acceptance of it. And I'm I'm almost at the point to say that's where we are today. <laughs> I, I I really am without bringing, because I don't, it's so politicized, I don't want to say anything about it, but the, what it is, is this abortion and then our rights. Uh, those are two things that we just got to stand up anyway. Uh, let me just keep, verse six and seven, let me just provide the reason for the oppression of Israelites. And here I'm going to do this, verse six and seven. Uh, I missed it somewhere, but they cried out, I started when the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord said. The God of Israel said, I have brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hands of the Egyptians and I delivered you from the hand of all of your oppressors. 
I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship idol gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. Okay. Here we see why God was allowing Israel to be punished because, and I said this before, they did not adhere to his commandments. They refused to listen. They went on doing things their way. But even in their hard-headedness, and we can relate to this, God gave him that he showed love and compassion for them. And he's faithful to respond to our cry. When the, when the young nation, before they became a nation, was in bondage, slave to Egypt, to the Egyptians, the Israelites cried out to God. You know, they had been in bondage for 430 years. God raised him up a deliverer, Moses, and he led them for 40 years in the wilderness. And did everything go all right in the wilderness? No. <laughs> because the first generation died out there in the wilderness. Moses took the young generation and taught them and handed the reins over to Joshua. And Joshua led these hard-headed folks. Now Joshua is dead. Here they in the nation, the nation of Israel, in the promised land that God kept his promise. He was faithful to it, in his promise. And they are enjoying it. He told them specifically, I am your God. I do not want you worshiping those other gods because I am the only one. And he had to remind them of what he'd done for them. And he said, now listen, I brought you out of what he said, slave. I rescued you from the midnight. I delivered you from the hands of your oppressor. I gave you their land. When these folks will go into, these folks, Israelites, the Israelites will go into war and put God first, they was always successful. But when they took their hands and their eyesight and stopped doing what God told them to do, and I'm going to say this for the third time, God just stepped aside and said, okay, you're on your own. Now, we as parents tell our kids the same thing. After we get tired of talking to them and trying to lead them in the right direction and they think, seem to be bent on going their own direction, we just have to say, okay, you're on your own. I have to take my hands off. Same principle. But do you stop loving them? No. Did God stop loving his people? No. And when he, he, he comes to their rescue, but we as parents, we go right on, we go back, even though we didn't say, I'm done with you. You're hard-headed. You don't pay attention. You're not listening to me. You know, we forgot. We done been down that road. We see all the pitfalls that you're going to get into. And out of love, we don't want you to get into those pitfalls. We don't want you to make the mistakes that we have made. Same principle what God is telling them. And he told them to do one thing. He said, do not worship the gods of the Amorites. You are living in their land but you do not have to worship him. And he said, do not bow down to Baal. And what did, what did the Israelites do? They did everything God told them not to do. Sound familiar? <laughs> they did everything. <laughs> oh. So even in his saying, I'm, I'm going to let you get a whipping for a while. I'm going to let you suffer for seven years but I'm going to come to you. And he sent an unnamed prophet to remind Israel. Now, God, don't forget, we do, for what God has done for us. We get so hung up on the blessing that we forget to bless all. And that's the wrong thing to do. We should always be thankful for the bless all and his compassionate care and his love to so much. He blesses us. So we can be a blessing to somebody else. And we forget all about how it came and we get hung up on the blessing. And 
we forget God. And that's not a good thing. But so he reminded them what he had done for us. And listen, I know we all can relate to an experience that we look at in our own life. But God brought us out of that situation. And I know I asked this question last year, last week. What do we do? We stop to tell him thank you, or do we have that sense of entitlement? Well, he has done, he just done what he is supposed to do. Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> Whether he was supposed to or not, the principle of it is show some expression of gratitude for what he has done. What's my point? Is that the Israelites, instead of being disobedient and doing what he told them not to do, they went ahead on and started worshiping those gods of the Amorites, even though they were in the land, he had get, God had given it to them. You just stay focused on God. If he had brought you and did all this for you, do you think he would not protect you when you serve him instead of the Amorites God? Do we just think that? Sometimes we as humanity have a very short memory. <laughs> and God has to remind us every once in a while <laughs> uh, that, listen here, you knucklehead, <laughs> I done A, B, C, and D, and I only told you to do one thing, and you can't do that. What's wrong with you? Do you not think that you can box me in and I can only do just so much? We tell him that by our actions, when we fail to do what he asks us to do. And we think, that, oh, well, this is popular. Let me just go get me get all tatted up from head to toe. I mean, the scripture says simply, thou should not have no cuttings or markings on your body. This is his body. And we have to always should remember we were created in his image. The physical flesh body housed the spiritual part of that. <laughs> we have a spirit, a soul, and a body. We are three in one, just like Jesus God is. When he said, let us, he was talking to the Son and the Holy Spirit. Okay, all right. And listen, and talking about us being hard-headed and not doing what he asked us to do, and that's to obey him. Worship him. Okay. And, 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 but now this principle applies to us today. And we now think that these lessons for them back over there, these lessons is a lesson as a message, as a principle for, that applies to our life. So we will not make the same mistake that they made. Now, let me ask this question. What we do to know and remember this, know this, there is a God. He is supreme. He's all knowing. He's all wise and he transcends all of his creation. And he is a jealous God when he tells us, humanity, thou should not have no other God before me. He means just that. He absolutely do mean just that. Now, let me say you this. He gets angry. Yes, he is loving, and he gets angry. We have seen in the scripture, and I just pointed out two instances, and our lesson is focusing on one of the instances when he was angry enough with Israel. He let the Midianites oppress him for seven years and further end the nation of Israel's history, and they, wouldn't, they kept going on this cycle of disobedience, oppression, and repentance, God will deliver. Till he used Babylon to keep him in captivity for 70 years. And he, but he went and got him. So what's my point? Disobedience brings punishment. It's better to obey. And I know we've all heard this, this phrase. Obedience is better than sacrifice. That may be a cliche. It might be a phrase. You might call it what you want to. But it is true and it is biblically principle based. Because in these lessons, we talk just this one. 
that when you oh, disobey God, there is a harsh consequences to pay. Whereas if you obey him, you will be rewarded. But in his loving nature, when we say, I'm sorry, Lord, I made a mistake. He, 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 still, he delivers us out of our situation, okay? And even in the midst of his anger, he will show us. Okay, now let, let's just go look at verses 11 through 13 and show his, his compassion for Israel, his chosen nation, okay? He, 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 showed, he knew that they needed a leader. At verse 11, we're talking about this angel and the angel, verse 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat down on the, an oak tree and opal that belonged to Joash the Abarite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep the Midianites from coming and taking his food. Okay, verse 12. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with thee, you mighty warrior. That's where the courage and comfort he was giving Midian, the confidence to take the courage and go and fight against the Midianites so they would, their oppression would cease. Okay, now. Here's this conversation. Let me go. And now, before I get to that, I want you to understand. I want us to understand how bad this oppression was. Just consider. I know us modern generations don't know anything about farming. <laughs> Have worked all year to produce your crop. And here you are, they're gathering in. And you're going to be pounced on by some evil people that have not worked today to produce nothing and take your crop. How are you going to and take the produce from your crop or the harvest from your crop and leave you without nothing? That's a hard pill to swallow. But that's what they were going through and uh, for being disobedient. Okay. Now, let me tell you this. God is loving, but he was, we have to pay the consequences of our sins. It has a consequence. All right. And we, when we're going through our suffering, we see this in this lesson. They cried out to God and he answered and he delivered. Even as we go back far as when they was in slave in bondage in Egypt, God delivered. Same situation. Now, where did I leave off? Now, let me read verse 13 from this conversation. And he said, pardon me, Lord. This is Gideon talking to the angel of the Lord. If the Lord is with us, why are we all happening to us? See, now, Gideon had a short memory because he knew they were not, the nation wasn't doing what they were supposed to do. They were worshiping those Amorite gods instead of the one true God. God didn't, need, he didn't, God didn't need remind. Gideon need to remind us if he answer his own question. Why are you letting this happen to us? And well, then he said, now, where's all of this wonders that our ancestors told about? So that tell me he knew something about what the answers. But if you don't do as according to God had instructed you to do, it wasn't for the ancestors to keep it was for you too. Every generation has to obey God. Same thing today. Whatever our parents and how they worship the one true God, it's the same principle for us and our, our young kids, our kids and grandkids and great grandkids. You have to worship God. Don't people let things happen to you that you had no clue of what's going to happen. But when you get in this situation, don't ask him, well, now listen, what you what, where were you? Did, aren't you the same God that took care of our four parents? Yes, he is. But what's the difference? Is they worshiped him, you didn't. You're not. <laughs> You're not. Okay. Mm. 
All right. So that was that. So now let me, because I'm almost out of time. Verses 6, 14 through 16 speaks to God sending Israel forth to deliver the Israelites out of the hand of the Midianites. Okay, let me read it real quick. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of the hands of the Midianites. I am sending you, okay? Because he didn't have the courage. And Gideon said, Get, this is his conversation, continued conversation. Gideon said, pardon me, my Lord, but how can I save Israel when my clan is weak from the clan of Manasseh and I am the least of my family? God don't care about your strength. When he sends you, he's going to give you the strength and the courage to be successful because he is all powerful, all known, and there's no failure in him. And then in the sixth last verse, he, God tells him this, I will be with you and you will strike down all of the Mennonites, leaving none of them alive. Now, listen, there is a, and I don't take all it off the top of my head right now, when God instructed the nation of Israel to kill all of their oppressors, and they did not. They left some. See, obedience again is better than sacrifice. Okay, so we have to be obedient in everything we do. Listen, when God told Egidi, go in thy mouth, who's my? Was it God's or Gideon? God is going to supply the strength. <laughs> you know, Gideon had already admitted that he was weak. And, but see, God knows our abilities. He know more about uh, our abilities than we do. Okay. And when God sends us somewhere, he's going to provide for us because there is no failure in him and we will be assured of being successful. We just need the confidence because confidence in ourselves bring courage. And let me say this. Uh, when we are embarking upon an endeavor and we have consulted with God and he said, yes, take courage because he's with you. He has blessed it and he is sanctioning. Now, <laughs> this is kind of funny and I don't know if I always said it or not. When he, when I accepted the call and I was telling a friend and she kind of said, hmm, if that's what he told you. I said, well, I wouldn't go on my own because that's somebody I won't play with. Because my arms are too short to box with me. And then I want to stay in his will and out instead of out of his will. And I'm saying this. When the God gives us a sign, go in confidence. That's where I'm through. I'm at, I just conclude. When God gives us a sign, go in confidence. We as believers, all of us, have an assignment to witness Christ. And if we are willing, God will always put somebody in our path who needs to hear word. Be confident in your son. Father, we thank you for the message this morning. Thank you for listening, all of you. And thank you for giving us an example that when we obey God, good things happen. But when we disobey God, we are going to suffer your wrath. But out of your love, you always come to our rescue. And we just thank you for being the loving God that you are. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Okay.